28 October 1942. It was long past time to be heading home. With the help of Sandro, the nicest of the porters at the Casa di Reposo, Antonia had managed to get her mother into a chair, the one by the window, the comfortable one they'd brought from home, and she'd passed the time by brushing Mama's hair and describing what she could see in the piazza below. She knew her mother could hear and understand, for didn't she turn to the San Antonio's voice when she arrived for a visit? Didn't she hold tight with her good hand and squeeze her fingers when her daughter whispered that she loved her? Papa was the best doctor in Venice beside, and he was sure that Mama could understand them. All the more important, then, to spend as many hours she could at her bedside. But the Campanelli at San Germain had chimed five, and... Papa would be waiting at home, and it wasn't safe to be out after dark, not anymore. I have to go home and help Marta with supper, and if I'm not there to remind him to eat, you know that Papa will keep on reading until he falls asleep at his desk. Shall I help you back to bed, or would you like to stay here until they bring you supper? Mama nodded, the movement so fleeting that anyone else would have missed it, but Antonio bent to kiss her cheek. She closed her eyes and lifted her face, still unlined, still so pretty, to the last of the sun. I'll be back in the morning. Try to keep eat your supper when they bring it to you, will you? Her journey home took her across the still busy piazza, through the gloom of the Soto Perego de Ghetto Novo, and up and down the steps of the bridge. Then quick turn into a narrow, darkening calais, then another, and finally perched at the edge of the murky water of the Rio del Ghetto, the slender afterthought of a fair house, its facade of patchwork of crumbling ochre stucco and rosy brick. The number had faded away long ago, but they never felt the need to repaint it. Everyone knew to knock on the green door for Dr. Mazin, and he would come, no matter the hour. Up the stairs she ran, her shoes squeaking on the freshly mopped landing, and along the hall to her father's study, but the sound of her voice within stopped her short. He might be speaking with a patient or writing down something important. She was, she was old enough to walk. She'd known never to barge in. She knocked twice and waited for the voices to still. Papa? Come in, came the reply, and she opened the door to discover her father was not at his guest, but the table by the window, and next to him was one of his oldest friends. Father Bernardi! Papa didn't tell me you were visiting. It's been months and months. He stood a little creakily and shook his hair hand. I know, my dear. I'm very sorry for that. If your father was telling me that you were visiting your mother, how is she? The same as ever, I suppose, but happy, at least. I hope she is. And you? I'm well. Weary of travel, longing for my own bed, but that's the worst of it. Glad to hear it. Hasn't Marta brought you anything? She asked dutifully, though she doubted they had anything worth sharing with guests. I only arrived a few minutes ago, and you know how your father and I are when we get to talking. But wait a minute, I have something for you. He reached for the overcoat he'd slung over the back of his chair, pulling it across his lap until he could rummage in the pockets. After a few moments, held up a small packet wrapped in newspaper. An impossibly delicious scent filled the air, French from friends who live abroad. He explained, coffee. Oh, Father Bernardi, you are so kind. Let me dig out our cafeteria, and it won't be long. She was standing on a chair, searching through the top shelves of the pantry, when Marta reappeared. What are you doing? Looking for the coffee maker. Father Bernardi is visiting. He, we haven't had coffee since his last visit. That was months ago. Marta sighed, typical of her size. It was drawn out, mournful, and vibrating with resentment. It will only get people talking. A Catholic priest, of all people, coming to visit. How your father even knows that man. He's been a patient of Papa's for years and years, and it's a friend, too. Papa always had people coming and going. I doubt anyone will care. Her protest was a formality, for Father Bernardi's visit would certainly be noted and remarked upon by everyone they knew. Had they lived anywhere else, no one would have cared, but the ghetto was a close-knit place, this sort of neighborhood where people loved nothing better than burrowing into each other's business, and so her father's agnostic learnings, as well as his avowed determination to be guided by science rather than faith, had long been a focus of local gossip. Her fingers closed around the worn aluminum of the coffee, coffee maker, dusty from disuse, and pulled it from its hiding place. Where's the grinder? In the next cupboard over. Do we have any sugar? A little. You know, if your father had bothered to tell me he was expecting someone, I had made my zete. He really only has himself to blame. Delicious as the zete were, 
Marta couldn't possibly have made the cookies. There was hardly any flour in the pantry, no raisins, barely enough sugar to sweeten the coffee. And they hadn't even seen a fresh egg in months. But pointing it out would have only led to more size. Instead, Antonia washed out the pot and set about the grinding. The barest handful of beans, so precious and rare, they might as well have been gilded. There was just enough in the little drawer of the grinder once she chased out every clinging speck to make two small cups of coffee, hardly more than a mouthful each. She'd reused the grounds for self, herself and Marta, for even watered-down coffee tasted better than the Café de Rosso made of roasted bar barley that some old told themselves was as good as the real thing. It was enough for now to smell the coffee as it brewed. As she divided it between the prettily decorated porcelain cups her parents had bought in Florence on their honeymoon, and she set them in the sugar bowl on a tray and hurried back to her father's study. The smell was the best thing about coffee, after all, and it was only so tantalizing because she was hungry. When she'd had her supper, she wouldn't notice it as much. The men were so intent on their conversation, they didn't look up when she entered, and she would, they would never be interrupted. So she went about sugaring the coffee, setting the cups in their, at their elbows, and taking her seat at the twin of her mother's chair, the casa. Her father spared her a smile. He drank down his coffee appreciatively, but his attention remained fixed on his friend. This city, these few islands, are the nearest things we Jews have to promised land in Europe. We have lived here unmolested for centuries, yet you suggest that we abandon it, and for what, her father said. The dubious welcome the Spanish might offer us, a panicked trek through the mountains before the Swiss turn us back. If you had listened to me when the first barred you from your work, from your profession. I belong nowhere else. I am as Italian as you. I was born here. I have no other home. What would become of me, of my family, of my patients? And the fascists have made no move against us beyond the racial laws. You speak of these laws as if they were something one might expect within the bounds of normal civil society. But they stripped you and every Jew I know of his profession. No, don't frown at me like that. Look at what they did to dear Dr. Jonah. The man is well into his 70s and retired years ago, yet still they removed his name from the register of physicians. His professorship at the university, gone. And all he has left is in his presidency of a Jewish community here. And that's hardly more than a formality. The laws are noxious on that, my dear Guido. We agree. But I have found a way to exist, just as we have always done. Her father leaned forward, his hands clasped so tightly his fingertips has gone white and his voice faded to a whisper. I've heard that the defeat of El Alamania is all but certain. Surely the tide must be turning. That may well be true, but it's turning far too slowly for my liking. In the meantime, El Duce grows more desperate. The Germans grow bolder, and we wait for the axe to fall. And it will fall. For it's only a matter of time before they seize power here, just as they did with Austria, with the rest of Europe, for that matter. And what then? Father Bernardi asked, his affable voice sharpening as his soul vanity. Only think, what if they were in power here? What would prevent them from rounding you up, just as you're, they're doing with Jews of Germany, of Poland, of France? And if I were to leave with Antonia, make the journey to Switzerland, what would become of my divorce? She cannot travel. You know that, and you know I will not leave her. Not as long as there is a breath in my body. Bad enough that she must live in that rest home. Her father wrenched off his spectacles and set about polishing them with his crumpled handkerchief. And from the way he pressed his lips together and pinched at the bridge of his nose, Antonia could tell he was fighting off tears. Just as he always did when he spoke of her mother, the stroke that had left her as a weekend, and the agonizing decision to move her to the rest home earlier this year. It was a good thing, she decided, that she hadn't allowed herself at any of the coffee, for even the idea of abandoning her mother was enough to tighten her throat and turn her empty stomach upside down. Her father was quick to notice her distress. Don't look so alarmed. We're safe enough here, aren't we? He asked Father Bernardi, and it seemed to Antonia that his eyes, as he looked at his friend, held a warning of some kind, but was it to be truthful or to be kind? The priest nodded, but his gentle smile didn't convince her. For the moment, yes, the priest said, but do not forget what we 
I won't, her father interrupted. I promise I won't forget. Well then, I ought to be on my way. I had only meant to stop for a minute or two. Father Bernardi stood, took a moment to find his balance, and then shook hands with her father. Thank you for your hospitality, turning to Antonia. He grasped her outstretched hand, both of his. I shall pray for your mother, my dear. Thank you, Father Bernardi. I wish you safe travels. While her father had said goodbye to his friend, she busied herself with collecting the cups and trays and returning them to the kitchen. Rather than leave the cups to Marta, who had broken all but three of the set over the years, she painstakingly washed and dried and put them away. Only after the other women, still grumbling about the annoyances and inconvenience of the priest's visit, had begun to prepare their supper, did Antonio return to the study. Her father was sitting in the chair that he had occupied earlier, and he now beckoned her forward. Come and sit with me. Were you happy to see Father Bernardi again? Of course. I was happy to see him, but, well, things are difficult, as you know. He risks a great deal coming in here. You were upset earlier when I came in with the coffee. I was but not with him. You know, we've always relished a lively discussion, but I do regret. What is it, she pressed, and it was impossible to keep the fear from her voice. He reached out to grasp her hand as he needed the reassurance of her presence. I meant what I said earlier about belonging nowhere else. And I can bear it, you know, these slights and these difficulties, as long as I can call myself a Venetian and Italian. But I do regret that your life has become so confined. I had hoped once that you might go to university. You, she began, but the words caught in her throat, choking her. She swallowed hard, waited a moment, and tried again. You never said. You never knew that you wanted such a thing for me. She'd been working her way through her, his textbooks for years, careful to never let him know, and not because she thought he'd disapprove. He'd always been so proud of her, and once she loved nothing more than to discuss her lessons and help with her schoolwork, but the racial law of 18, 1938 had expelled her and every other Jewish student in Italy from school, and when her father had told her of it, he had broken down and wept. It was the first time Tony had ever seen him cry. So she decided that it would be far kinder to simply borrow his books and memorize as much as she could, and then one day, when she was allowed to go to school again, she would be ready. Oh, of course I did. I still do. A bright girl like you belongs in a university, not spending your days in the rest home or queuing up for bread or oil, or the war won't last forever. I might still go to school once it ends. You might, he admitted, or perhaps, perhaps I might teach you some of what I know, as if you were one of my students in Padua. I don't miss those long hours on the train on my teaching days, but I do miss my students, and I think you would make a very good doctor. Do you think? I would love nothing more, she promised, blinking her heart. It was silly to cry over something that was good. We'll be constrained by our circumstances. It will be far from a comprehensive education, but I can give you an idea, if nothing more, of what medicine is like. If it's something that suits you, when do we start? You've been reading through my library for years, so I expect you'll whirl on your way. You knew? she asked. Though she ought not to have been surprised, she ought to have known that he would notice. Of course I did. Perhaps I ought to have said something. Encourage you in your studies. Still, books can only teach you so much. You'll learn more by coming with me on some of my visits. I'll ask permission, of course, but I think most of my patients will be content to have you present. And will be helpful to have an extra pair of hands. So I will watch you as you work? Yes, you will watch, and in time you will learn to see how you will listen, and then you will learn to, how to hear. And that, my darling, is how a doctor is made.